I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're delving into history, education, and why it is crucial with author Patrick Rickards. He has written a powerful book, an essential book. It is called Why History Matters, American History Educators Speak Out. In this insightful collection, top K-12 educators share their strategies and experiences in making American history engaging and relevant. Today, we will discover the importance of learning our nation's past and how it shapes our present and future. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Authors Tranquility Press for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his important book. The links are below this interview. Patrick, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Thanks for having me, Logan. I appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. Uh, I feel like when it comes to American history, let alone world history, uh, Americans tend to be pretty illiterate, don't you think? Unfortunately, yes. And I will say before, I, I run a nonprofit called the Driving Force Institute, which is focused on transforming the teaching and learning of American history. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did to, to launch this important nonprofit is we did a national survey to really get a sense of what the average American knows when it comes to our own history. And we took questions that come from the practice test for the U.S. citizenship exam, multiple choice questions that everyone needs to know if they want to become a citizen of this great country. And unfortunately, we found that fewer than four in 10 could pass that test, uh, could get at, at least 12 out of 20 questions correct. Uh, and the numbers are even more startling for those under the age of 45. There are only 27% were able to pass. And it just shows that we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We talk about how important history is. We give it a great lip service, uh, but it's not reflected in either what is being learned or what is what is in interesting to individuals today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Finding an effective way to teach history is important. And I feel as though in this digital age, when there are so many videos available um, and supplemental materials available, that you can teach history in a more impactful way. Do you agree with that? I completely agree with that. I mean, one of the things Driving Force does is we create short films, two, two and a half minutes in length. The, the average time that you have a 16 year old's attention on YouTube, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but what is essential, I think, Logan, to what you're talking about is it needs to be interesting and relevant to the learner. I think that's one of the challenges we have. You know, the basal textbooks that you and I probably used when we were in high school ourselves are the ones that are still being used. And quite frankly, today's young people just find that boring and irrelevant. You know, they're, they're tired of learning only about dead white male landowners. And it becomes so important to figure out what, what is the role of women? What is the role of, of people of color? in the shaping of our country? What are all those stories that you're not told about uh, that make it interesting, that make it compelling? When you do that, you can drive learners down the rabbit hole. Absolutely. And you have to present a narrative that's engaging and like you said, relevant as well. Uh, what was your inspiration to compile these essays from top American history educators? Was it your foundation? The foundation was part of it. I think the work that we do across the country, you know, you hear so often, uh, you know, individuals that are bemoaning the state of American education today. Uh, and they'll talk about it even with regard to history. They'll talk about, you know, how lousy teachers are. They'll talk about how they're not teaching. They'll eat with, with history and social studies teachers in particular, you'll have individuals that will simply say, well, you know, they're, they're simply the coaches. They have to give them something to teach. And, you know, we started off, you know, we, we did we did some research really understanding who's teaching American history today. Uh, and we have great teachers across the country, but you have great teachers across the country at a time when so many people are urging them not to teach our history. Uh, you know, you look at what's happened, you look at parents who protest what's being taught in the classroom. And, you know, the, the, the simple fact of the matter, American history is inspiring, it's disruptive, it's infuriating, it's dark, it's uplifting, it's incredibly complicated. And you have to be able to teach all of it. And when you start getting teachers who are afraid to teach the facts or afraid to teach history, it, ma it makes it much, much more challenging to really connect with learners. And so as we went around the country and we were talking with educators about what works for them, uh, it was just absolutely inspiring to hear from teachers about why they teach what they teach 
and how they're able to connect with learners. So for all that we hear about the fact that we're not teaching history anymore, that's just not true. We have an incredible number of educators across this country who are passionate about this, who are committed to it, and are doing so in creative ways that are connecting with their learners in ways most of us could only dream of. Tell us about some of those creative ways. Well, I think, you know, we, we, we for people of my generation, you know, we have that, that view of you know, the dead poet society where you have teachers jumping on desks. And, and there is some of that. I mean, you can talk to, to those, you know, those teachers that will get dressed up in costume to try to connect with learners. Uh, you know, instead, it's often about telling the stories that they don't know. Mm. Uh, it's about being able to connect, making things clear in a way that you recognize. You know, I talked to one teacher who had explained that you know, for, for her students, this is in New York City, they really didn't care at all about Franklin Roosevelt, was completely irrelevant to their lives. Uh, until you started explaining how he was responsible for creating social security. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it connected. You had, you know, some of those of those learners, both high school and middle school, wait, wait a minute, my, my grandmother depends on that. That's important. Tell me a little bit more. That becomes essential. Telling about history within your own backyard. You know, we've been fortunate enough to work with some teachers in Kentucky, you know, who, who came to us after we had launched our own initiative. They said, look, yes, you're absolutely right. Teaching and teaching about American history is hard. It's even harder to teach our own kids about what's happened in their own state. And so focusing on some of those stories and helping them see that, you know, history can be exciting. It can be interesting. You can even teach history by teaching, you know, the history of whiskey in a place like Kentucky. Yeah. But it's really, I, I think it comes down to teachers finding ways to connect one-on-one -on -one with the learner. Uh, you know, really figuring out this is not something we're just going to sit here and learn. Uh, we're going to we're going to read a long text that is going to be incredibly boring and dense. It's really helping them begin to connect the dots and see this matters because of that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I like the idea of backyard learning. You know, if you're from Winston Salem, find out the history of tobacco and why it was essential to the development of this country. Although we despise tobacco now, you know, that was such a profitable crop for, you know, a long time, uh, that's for sure. How important is it to have computer mediated learning in school um, where kids can learn at their own pace, where they can learn as much or as little as they want on particular matters, where they can click and go in depth? Tell us about that. Well, I think when we look at those who are in school today, we've never had a less homogeneous student population than we do now. You know, that means you have learners that are coming in with different skills, with different knowledge, with different aptitudes, with different deficiencies and with different abilities. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that technology does, it allows us to equalize the field. Uh, it really allows us to connect in ways that make sense. And I, I think it, it's it's a great shame. You look at states, I think California is the most recent one that's now talking about how do you ban cell phones in the classroom? Well, let, let's remember, it doesn't matter if you're a 12th grader or you're a third grader today, you're a digital native. Right. Um, you, are, you, you essentially live with a cell phone in your hand. The question should not be, how do we ban the technology? The question should really be, how do we harness the technology to better connect with learners? And I think that's one of the things, you know, we, we've been able to do, we've been incredibly fortunate. You know, we've, we've produced now 500 short films. We have 60 million users across the country. Everything is optimized for a cell phone if somebody wants to, wants to use that. But I think one of, when you talk about the power of technology, I will tell you, Logan, I think one of the most powerful things that I can speak of to our own work is, you know, we look now at literacy rates in this country. You know, it's no secret that you know two thirds of fourth graders are not reading at grade level or above. And one of the great benefits of using technology to teach history was we talked to teachers and we never expected it at first. But they said, look, we're, we're working with high school students. We're able to use these films to start discussions, to begin dialogue within our class about why this is so important. And this is powerful because for all of those lagging readers, for all of those who are struggling to keep up, this allows them to learn. It's okay. not a matter of making sure, are they reading at an eighth or a 10th grade level so they can comprehend what's in the textbook? They can watch a short film. They can all of a sudden understand why this is important. And it's not necessarily then about teaching the history. It's about using the technology to inspire one to continue learning. 
you're a struggling reader, you're able to learn through film, there are going to be things you're going to realize you're now passionate about, you're interested in, you want to continue to pursue. You can't have that if all you're doing is using the written word. Absolutely. In fact, I listened to an audio book um, on George Washington just a couple of years ago. And, you know, it's this thick. I probably never would have gotten around to reading it. Um, but it was beautifully produced, beautifully read. Um, it was written by the great historian Isaac, whatever his name is. Um, and it gave me such great insight into understanding the complexities of um, George Washington in a way that I never learned in school. Even though, you know, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, you know, Booker T. Washington, Rosa Parks, those are the only historical figures that seem to jump out at me from my memory of being in school. Um, tell me a little bit about these 500 films you produced. They're short films. What, what are some of the subject matters in them? Sure. So what we do is, you know, with Driving Force Institute, we try to provide sort of a, a wide range. And so we do the different time periods. Uh, we will look at people, we will look at artifacts, we will look at events, uh, we will look at locations, all, all the things that we think are important. It's really about telling the untold history. And then that, and all of our films are available free of charge. You can find them on YouTube under the Untold History history banner. But you know, it's really about how do we provide these bite-sized nuggets? Uh, you know, how do you how do you tell stories that are important that, that, as I said, are largely getting left out of the textbooks? Or how do you teach stories in a new way? You were talking about teaching the history of tobacco in Winston-Salem, an incredibly important one. You know, one of the films we do is how do you explain the 10th Amendment to the average 10th grader? How do you explain states' rights in a way that makes sense? And we put together a film on hotboxing. So we're using marijuana laws to make clear that this is something that is indeed important. If you understand different states' rights and the ability to buy something in one state that you can't buy in another. But it's also about those, those people that we don't know about that become fascinating. Uh, I was just telling the story yesterday. One of the first films we did is one of my favorites. It's about Madame Queenie. And most of us have never heard of Madame Queenie. And she becomes incredibly important. Not only was she one of the first, if not the first, uh, Black woman gangster in New York City. But she was essential because what she did was she recognized at the time, we're talking about the early 1900s, that no bank in New York would allow the African-American community to bank there. And she created an alternative banking system for her own community. You know, those are the sorts of stories that just become, you know, again, when you look and you see there's nobody like me in the history books. People like me did not play a role. So you see, you know, we, we've, we've done a, a tremendous amount of, of work in partnering with places like New York Historical Society and American Battlefield Trust and the Smithsonian in producing these films. But you see the role that women play. You see the role that the African-American community has played, the Latino community has played, the Native American community, the Asian community, the LGBT plus community. All of their stories are stories that are told. They're all stories that demonstrate that history can be inspiring if we're learning the right things. I think you hit the nail on the head there. You're talking about story upon story. It has to be stories. Stories connect with people. That's why films connect with people. And that's why textbooks don't, because it's a list of facts and jargon. And like you said, you, they've been reading them since the 1960s and they haven't fundamentally changed. Maybe now they come with a DVD that gets thrown away, right? It is. And I, and I think, Logan, is, it's one of those things that you know, I, I remember working with teachers back in 2021. And there, there was almost this moment of either panic or dread with them. January of 2021, how could they possibly teach January 6 in their classroom, despite all of their students wanting to hear more about it? Because most of those learners watched it unfold on TikTok that day. And they were petrified of teaching this and drawing the ire of parents, whether you're talking about parents on the far right or parents on the far left. And I remember explaining them, there, there are ways we can talk about this where we begin to connect moments. You know, you can talk about Puerto Rican terrorists opening fire on the congressional floor in the 1950s. You can talk about the British burning the US Capitol uh, during the War of 1812. There are ways to connect it so that you're not having to spend time talking specifically about January 6th but are able to show that this is, while tragic, is not unique. We've seen these sorts of things. We've seen assaults on our Capitol before. 
Uh, you know, that's a way, you know, it really becomes empowering for educators that recognize the importance in teaching and in connecting with their learners while also being respectful of what their communities will and won't allow them to teach these days. Exactly. I mean, even deciding whether you describe it as a riot or an insurrection is a huge decision because mom and dad are going to be coming to school if you call it an insurrection and other moms and dads will be coming to school if you don't call it an insurrection. So parents are caught in this completely crazy, hyper-partisan world, right? They are. And I, I think that that's the beauty of the work that we do. It's the beauty of what you see in the book that we've, we've compiled with teachers is that, you know, if you're going to teach history, you've got to teach all sides of history. Uh, you know, this, this, this is not, we're not teaching advocacy. And I think that that's one of those challenges when you see so many people that are calling for the teaching of civics, for instance, is we're teaching civic engagement, not necessarily civic education and government. But I think, you know, when you look at the, at the titles that we've produced, you look at the recommendations that come from teachers, you know, you will see things that will make a, an arch conservative happy and will make an arch conservative's blood boil. You will see the same thing for progressives. Obviously, it's, it's going to be different things that, that get different reactions from those two crowds. But, you know, we, we've been able to produce films for the state of Florida, including helping them teach American history and government to kindergartners, elementary school students. We've been able to focus on things like the 1619 Project. You know, all of that is involved because that is history in its totality. Uh, and I think that really, you know, it's one of those things, you know, for parents, when they, when they understand that, when they realize it might not be about their child needing to learn all 500 films that we have, but there are films there that are going to make everybody proud. There are films here that are going to make everybody wonder what else don't I know? Absolutely. Whether it's on the grammar school level or elementary school level, middle school, high school, or even college, I've often thought in this day and age of technology, why don't we have the absolute best, most articulate, most eloquent uh, professors, teachers, you know, record their lectures and then perhaps even put B-roll in and illustrate them as well. Uh, why isn't that done more? I mean, uh, it's we have the capability. Why do we constantly lean on just live teachers who have, you know, done it day in, day out? Maybe recording a lecture might be good and something beyond just like, you know, what we see in community colleges or other colleges, you know, somebody leaning into a YouTube video and reading, you know, slides. I think you're absolutely right, Logan. I, th I think it's one of those things we we've seen higher education try to dip their toe into it. Uh, and they, they've they've created they've had some issues with regard to simply who owns the intellectual property. Does it belong to the university or does it belong to the professor who's speaking it? Uh, I think what we've seen in K-12 and, you know, COVID helped us realize that there is incredible power in harnessing technology and flipping the classroom where you're able to have students, you know, spend the time, say, watching these films at home. Here are three films that we're going to discuss this week. And so instead of spending your classroom time having to listen to a lecture. We can spend our classroom time engaging, having conversations, having discussions, even having disagreements. There's nothing more American than having a good fact-based disagreement. Uh, and I think that really is the future. I think we are recognizing that particularly as, as we realize there's no one size fits all to education. Uh, and you know, we're, we're now, I think, starting to see the power that technology can have. I think the challenge is making sure that educators realize that that technology is designed to supplement what they do in the classroom, not supplant it. Uh, you know, it really, we're not looking to replace teachers with, with videos. Uh, you know, we're looking to figure out how can you provide teachers with the tools so that they can better connect with their students. I right. think when we do that, when you figure out how to flip that classroom, where you're using those lectures and really giving the teachers then the power to guide the understanding, and I think that's what's so important about this in the history space in particular. You know, we're talking about finding these moments, these people, these places that are gonna interest a learner. And you're using it to teach critical thinking. You're using it to develop cognitive abilities. You're using it to help students probe, ask questions, begin to wonder why. You know, we often talk about wanting to help all learners think like historians. That doesn't mean we expect all high school students to one day want to write somebody's biography. Right. What it means is it's that it's that probing, it's that critical thinking, it's the questioning that all of us benefit from. 
And we have to figure out how to how to empower young learners with it as well. Exactly. Exactly. And we're supposed to be in if you're an educator in the business of empowering young people, um, of building their lives, making them better. If you are from an institute like Harvard or Yale, if your lectures are so wonderful and they're so empowering to your student body, why don't they work at Borough of Manhattan Community College? Why can't we send these lectures there? Because, you know, they might not have the budget to hire this MD, PhD, who's lecturing on molecular physics. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're absolutely correct. And I think what it also does, I think the power of technology also lets us realize that sometimes the best teaching and the best learning is happening outside of the name brand. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're all drawn, you know, we, we think that if you go to an Ivy League institution, that's where the best faculty are. You know, for the average 18, 19 year old college student, that's not going to be the case. They're the ones that are being taught by teaching assistants. Uh, you know, there are incredible teachers that are out there. And I think, you know, we see that here in the United States. You know, I, I work over the years with a, a tremendous cadre of educators that are White House uh, Historical Association fellows. Uh, they, they're teachers who continue to spend their summertime learning more about the presidency and the White House to bring it back to the class. That sort of commitment, you know, those teachers who are recognized as Gilder Lehrman fellows, for instance, in New York, you know, out of New York, those are teachers who are committed to continuing to improve their practice. And I think they're the ones that they're they're inspiring that next generation of educator. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the fact, and you pointed this out, that the pandemic turned things around in American education in a good way, um, because there was a real snobbery when it came to online learning, you know, it, it was, you know, kind of looked at as the red haired stepchild, if you will. Um, and then suddenly it was embraced and now is still embraced. I mean, Harvard for the last uh, few weeks of their um, semester canceled classes and had everybody online because of, uh, you know, protests happening over Gaza on their campus. But suddenly there was this 180 degree shift saying, oh, there's really no difference. Do you think I, there's a difference? And in some ways, do you think it's better? Uh, I, Logan, to be completely honest, I, th I think using, you know, blended education where we're using technology and using online platforms, I think improves education. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think it, it allows us to better relate to the learner. Uh, you know, we did see in K-12, you know, after we finally reopened the schools, you saw some schools that were looking to pull it back. And I think they've recognized that the technology isn't going anywhere. You know, this is now about making sure that our teachers are equipped with the skills and knowledge to use it effectively because our learners want it. Uh, you know, it, it's a matter of making sure that you're providing online connections to students, particularly those in poor and rural communities where they might not have it. Uh, it's about making sure that we're able to teach it through a tablet or through a phone and it doesn't require a desktop computer. Uh, but I very much believe that is that is where we are headed, because what it does is it also allows us as learners to decide what we want to learn. Uh, you know, it gives us the power uh, in selecting those pieces. Now, the, the, the only the only I think true downside from what we learned with regard to technology and online learning from COVID is it's meant for millions of students every winter as we've done away with snow days. Uh, you know, now they simply switch to digital learning for those days. And you know, I, I, it's, my, my kids are too old for that now. But I think there was that time where we all need a little bit of play and relaxation in our lives. Exactly, exactly. God forbid they get rid of summer vacation. I think it was threatened the entire time I was in school. And that was the only part of school that I truly enjoyed, which was uh, summer vacation, because I was a, a lot like Mark Twain. All my life was a learning experience, except those years that I spent in school. But I was taught by men and women who were dressed in black from their head to their feet and little caps on their heads. So uh, they were pretty tough, those teachers, that's for sure. Of all the um, essays that you compiled uh, for Why History Matters, is there a standout? I know it's asking you to choose among, you know, children here, um, but uh, maybe one or two stand out so it's a little more equitable. I, I think that there is a tremendous story in Georgia uh, where a, a teacher who teaches both in K-12 and higher education uh, was able, it goes to what you were talking about earlier, about location learning and was able to take her students to see some of the locations that were essential during the Civil War. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and many of these students never, never, never would have dreamed of seeing that. They don't really even necessarily know the history. I think her, her story becomes incredibly powerful. Uh, I think, you know, seeing how individuals and in there, uh, there are a couple, there's one from New Jersey. There's also one from, from Kansas uh, where they're able to talk about their personal connection uh, and realize just, you know, whether it be they as an immigrant, whether it be they as an English language learner and how history uh, is what made that connection. I think those become important. Uh, but I think you know, overall, you know, I, I don't mean to, to short sell it, but I think overall what becomes so powerful, you read essay after essay, uh, and you can see the passion with which these teachers have uh, in teaching this, in understanding how important their job is, what happens when we equip the learners with this knowledge. And you know, we, 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 closed, the, we closed the book uh, with a Q and A that I did with James McPherson, who's you know a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, uh, professor emeritus at Princeton University, uh, and you know he just talks about just how important this is, not as an academic, not as a college professor, not even as an author, uh, but really recognizes why we as Americans need to better understand where we come from. You know we're always so flipped to say you know if you don't understand history you're doomed to repeat it. We don't even know what that means. Uh, but I think, you know, we see, we, we seem to believe every time we hit a moment in this nation's history that we're unicorns, that we've never experienced this before. And we know that's not true. Uh, and I think that the importance of this and what the, these, these educators make clear in the book, that when we know history, it allows us to learn from our mistakes and from our failures. And it allows us to ensure, hopefully, that we don't repeat those failures, that we're free to commit all new mistakes in the future. Uh, but it really demonstrates that this is something that we all should care about. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, that's a great note to leave you on, but we have a couple more minutes. So I want to ask you this question. Um, how can parents, educators, tap into the resources of Drive Force? Sure. So I think you, you, you can go to our website, drivingforceinstitute.org. Uh, but more, if you want to simply tap into the videos, because we also do teacher professional development, a host of other things. If you just want to see the films that we've created, uh, you can go to untoldhistory.org. Every one of our films is free. Every week we release two new films. As I said, we've now produced 500 films. We've begun a new initiative uh, called Essentials in preparation for our nation's 250th birthday in July of 2026. We are creating another 500 films that look at that core, the basics everybody should know about our country. And we're fortunate to be doing this in partnership with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, with Mount Vernon, with the Abraham Lincoln Library, the Bill of Rights Institute, many other fine institutions to make sure that all of this is available. It will be on a new AmericanHistory.org website uh, so that everybody has access, not just to these films, but to the wealth of resources that all of our partners make available each and every day. Wonderful, wonderful work you're doing there with Drive Force. Wonderful work you did with this book. It is called Why History Matters. American history educators speak out. It is an insightful collection. Top K through 12 educators share their strategies and experiences in making American history both engaging and relevant. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate the time. I appreciate your time. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.